All right, so we are recording. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, That's a pleasure. For taking the time to, uh, to be here with us tonight. Uh, we are very excited to read Tin Man this month and very excited to have a celebrity in our midst. <laughs> Where? <laughs> behind you modest, <laughs> modest to a fault <laughs> thank you for choosing um the book i'm you know i do appreciate it so much and thank you all for reading it it's uh it's such a big deal you know really really thank you well we i mean it's such a beautiful a beautiful story and um i was so happy when it won i don't know if you know how the the books are chosen but it's actually a vote so i didn't oh, choose it was chosen by democracy um, globally. We have 85,000 members all across the world. So um, it wasn't one person choosing it, but it certainly, um, it, it won. So that was very exciting. Uh, I wanted to just kick this off, Sarah, by asking you kind of like a quick fire round of questions. Okay. Um, there's just a few of them, but it's just kind of like a little fun way to get um, into, into the questions. Okay. Um, so the first question is audiobooks, yay or nay? Are my books yay or nay? Audiobooks. Do you like them? Yes. No, I thought you said, are my books yay or nay? And it's like, oh, no, I this must be like tech talk. Um, audiobooks, yay. yay. I love doing audiobooks. I always read my audiobooks. And everybody who comes back and everyone I know who, who listens to audiobooks, um, there's usually quite a specific reason for it as well. And so it's, it's another way of getting stories out there, which is imperative. Okay. Yay. Next question is dawn or dusk? Oh, these are supposed to be quick fire, aren't they? You know that I'm, okay, that this is not, this is so the wrong person to do quick fire. Um, <laughs> dusk. Okay, um, the next one is invisibility or superstar strength or super, sorry, super strength. Oh, invisibility. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a nickname your parents used to call you? No, no. Um, no, well, actually, you know what? I'll tell you something. This is, I know it's quick fire, but my mother named my brother and I so that the names couldn't be shortened. So Sarah, she couldn't shorten it. But when I was a child, I became Sari. So it sort of was. So probably that would be the closest to an answer to you. I mean, it's an awful thing. Thank God it didn't continue into adulthood, but there you go. <laughs> I don't think it sounds so bad. <laughs> Well, well, it's, I don't know. It's like a little sausage dog. Siri! <laughs> uh, and the last one in our quick fire round is um, scale one to ten, how good of a driver are you? A driver? Um, well, I don't drive anymore, so impeccable. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. I'm really brilliant at map reading and uh, sitting in the front extremely grateful and I give a lot of people confidence when they're driving and I sit there going oh you did that very well what a lovely park fantastic oh you took that corner extremely well so 10. Awesome I want to go driving with you already. You can you can. <laughs> um, I was just wondering to start off if you could just talk us through because it's not often that we have somebody who's come from the silver screen and has made her her start in her career was actually on television and in movies. And now you don't do as much of that, but um, can you just talk us through how it all kind of happened? How it happened was really, really simply. It was one of those, um, we go back, we're gonna go back a long way. We're gonna go back to school, actually. So I was at um, an all girls school. It was a state school, but it was still an all girls school. And we didn't do any art and at that particular time, or very, very little. And I was like most children, you know, up until 11 or 12, really, really very creative um, and loved all that. And then as I went along in the sort of the 12 to the 17, 18 years, it was all focused on um, exams, which is happening very much. So that was, that was the only important thing. 
And I felt myself gradually, gradually, gradually get more and more quiet, a little bit more shut down on that side of things. And what happened when people came to leave, so when they were about 17 or 18, they used to stand up in assembly and they used to have to tell the rest of the school what they were going to do. So we're going way back. We're going like 30 odd years, something like that. And at the time, nursing was really, really popular and a career. You know, it's changed a little bit now, but it was very so we had a lot of nurses. We had, um, uh, we had uh, university, university, because that was what the school was set up for. So a lot of university, university, and I'm sitting there, hardly breathing, head down, you know, just waiting for something to come in and change my life. And then this young woman stood up and she said, I'm going to Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. And I was like, wow, so am I. And that's how it started. It was like one of those moments where, which I kind of call creative instinct, whereby something came in and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And I hadn't done a play by then. It was just, that's what I had to do. So I went to drama school. Um, thank goodness it took me about three attempts to get in. And then, um, and that's what started, that's what started storytelling. And so, you know, you learn, you learn how to communicate with an audience and you learn how to sp speak brilliant words by brilliant authors. And there's a great connect between what's going on here in your heart. Um, and so it continued. And I did that probably up until, uh, I did it well up until I was about 35 or 36. And then, and then things started to slow down. And I could see that, that sort of cliche that when you reach 40, I hadn't been established enough for, for work to continue. And it pretty much stopped. And I'd always written screenplays to some degree during that period of time. But um, a lot of actors do that. It's kind of a way of maintaining control. And they weren't made, but they used to come back and nobody said that I was a bad writer. And then what happened was that... Um, I need to do something. And so I went to an adult education center. It's called City Lit. And I did two terms, a very, very sweet course called Exploring Fiction. It was more humanities. It wasn't creative writing. And uh, people from all walks of life were there. And at the end of each lesson, the teacher said, well, if you want to do, you know, an exercise on place or character or time, you know, she would give us something. And you could do it or you didn't have to do it. But if you did it, then you had the opportunity of reading it out the following week. Um, and I did two terms, and then I ended up with 40,000 words of a novel I had no intention of writing, I suppose. But that novel then, that sort of, that amount of words then, then managed to get me a, a literary agent. And, and that, that's kind of it. That's how it happened. So was that first 40,000 words, was that ever published? No, but the story is, which is what most people don't know, that 40,000 words was a story called Tin Man. Oh, wow. So this is actually your first novel? Theoretically, it's my first novel, but it wasn't. It was completely rewritten. So the things that stayed in place that were the same is the fact that it was set in Oxford. That was really important. It was set in Oxford. But the part of Oxford that I call East of the Plain. The Plain is an area of Oxford of four roads converging to the west of the Plain is the university part of Oxford, which is what is usually written about in most literature. And my family all came from Oxford. I wasn't born there, but all my family came from Oxford. I wanted to write about the working class conservative area of Oxford that is East Oxford. If you follow the Cowley Road up, you get to a place, um, where is the car factory? Uh, in Cowley and my grandparents worked there. My grandmother cleaned in the factory and my grandfather worked there. Um, and I wanted to write about that because people always imagine that Oxford is just a privilege and in my family it wasn't. My, my, mother's grand, my mother's father also had a greengrocer shop on Cowley Road. And so that stayed the same. People always say that you write about what you know with your first novel. And it was very pertinent that I did write about it during that period of time, the time that I used to spend as a grandchild, really, in that city, so in the 60s and the 70s. And I wanted to write about it. I wanted to write about what happens in an area, in a working class area, where your destiny is pretty much laid out for you. 
that you are gonna go over the road to that factory, you know, because it's an area whereby difference isn't celebrated, really. You're gonna follow through the constraints of birth what is laid out for you. And I was thinking, well, what would happen? What would you need? Who would you need to be your champion to change that? If you were a good artist or if you were wanting to do something different, what would need to be in place? And that was still part of that original novel. And some of the characters were sort of there, but it was far, it was a bigger novel and it was broader and it wasn't made. One of the things that people as made, I'm talking about it, it's a film script, sorry, I'm in a completely different place, but it wasn't published. And a lot that came back at that point was people said, it's not a first novel. And I didn't understand that at the time. And I do understand it now. The first novels usually are what a publisher can hang a marketing campaign on. And it was a very quiet novel. You know, very, you know, very gentle. Absolutely, like a second or third novel, you know, one that just came. But my agent was very clever. So when after Rabbit, that was a one book deal, they said, you're gonna write another book. He said, yes, you'll write your new book, but you've got to take the first book. So I always imagined that I was going back to this book to edit it. And it was the first time that I had a deadline and the deadline was um, July, 2016. I had a big, big publicity uh, tour with the second, with Marvelous. And by the time I came to look at this Tin Man, this first book again, it was in December. So I had basically six or seven months, but that was fine because I thought it was an edit. And then when I opened the pages, I was like, oh my God, mm -hmm. I've told this story. I've already told this story before. I don't write like this anymore because I was a better writer. What am I gonna do? What, what, what is the story here that I haven't told? So the story was Oxford still, I hadn't told that. Story about arts, a story about the factory, about this particular job in the factory called Tin Man, a tinny, who for me always captured my imagination in, in a rather overly romantic way because he was sort of highly specialized panel beater. But I still thought, who would do that job? Who would have that kind of artistic sensibility and that desire, the pursuit of perfection and, and beauty? And so I, I thought, okay, I want that in there. And it was very clear that it was almost like reframing a photograph where you have all these characters and then you, you just go, it's that, it's that that I haven't told the story of these two men, really. It is the triangle, but it's the story of these two men. And I felt very, very um, compelled to write an aid story that I hadn't at that time um, because that was obviously part of, of my young adulthood as well. So. So that's sort of how it, how it sort of came about. Wow, that's really fascinating actually because, well, for many reasons, but the fact that it, it was a portion of the very first thing you wrote and it came back to life eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember at the time saying to somebody, oh yeah, I'm going back to write a book. And they said, wouldn't it be easier to write a new book? And I went, that's the last thing I want to do at this stage. Right. Which is always, it's, you never know what, what you're gonna be asked to do. But, you do it, you know? And even though I say that I wrote it in five months, which is very quick for me, because I don't, knowing what the book wasn't saved me a year, I think. And that's what people don't realize, that half the time what rewriting is, is constantly getting rid of what a book isn't. It is the taking away of the marvel until it takes shape. And so I had what it wasn't already in front of me which was extremely useful once they'd gone over the panic. Um, can we focus just for a second on the differences between, and it's interesting now that you've explained it a little bit, um, when God was a rabbit in a year of marvelous ways are very, very, very different books to this one. Um, and yep. I, I mean, even, I think, I know one of them is set in Cornwall. I'm not sure if both of them are set in Cornwall, but, um, so this was, was all based on kind of your, your journey as an author and what your publisher wanted and what, your, your, um, what was going to like make your journey as an author work? No, it's just what I wanted to choose to write. I mean, I've, I've had that freedom. I, wouldn't, I would never hand over asking ever to a publisher what they thought I should write. Right. I just, that would be 
anathema of the whole process for me. And so each book, they are different. But I've also, you know, I haven't come from creative writing or academia or literature. I've come from oral storytelling. I've come from, you know, an artistic arena or, or theater or film whereby people, directors would think, well, what's the color grading? What am I wanting to show? What am, you know, what's the ratio aspect of this film? And that's sort of how I feel when I write a book. It's like, well, okay, what am I doing this? What is the place? What is the tone of this book? What does it feel like? What is, you know, what is the voice? Who are the people in it? And, and they will be different. You know, Marvelous was very, very different. I think it shocked a lot of people that came out. For me, it's a very, very natural continuum of Rabbit. Rabbit was partly set in Cornwall, but majority it was set where I was brought up in East London. So those scenes uh, in Redbridge, in that sort of part, they call it Essex, but it was East London at that point, sort of the Eastern suburbs. That was where I was brought up as a child. And so it was very pertinent and I knew that. And then when we went to that part of Cornwall, that was also where my grandparents moved. So again, it was a very, very familiar landscape. When I moved over to Marvelous, which was all set in a creek, I wanted to, to take the influence of Toni Morrison and, and sort of the black American writers of these very feminine landscapes, as I called them, these very mudder, muddy, fertile creeks that are kind of synonymous with the southern part of Cornwall as you go up the Fowl River and you have that because actually Cornwall is punched through with five granite mountains which is, to me is very masculine and so I wanted to place a character down there and I wanted to place it in a period of time that she could have been forgotten um, so so it was a very thought out novel but it was mostly a celebration of, of oral storytelling and how older people script their lives at the end of their lives and so the story has come out absolutely verbatim they've said it so many times before what often happens certainly with this book was that it was um it was about a woman whose life wasn't that triumphant but she retold it and she 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 gained power in the telling of the version of herself that she wanted people to hear and so then by the time i got to tin man it was a small story it was a very contained, it was almost like a chamber piece. I knew it's going to be small because the other two were spread over the breadth of time. You know, Rabbit was 40 years, Marvelous was, well, almost 25 years really when she's talking about her love affair. And I wanted, it was like a chamber piece. I wanted to write something that, impact, that had the same impact for me uh, that was on Chesil Beach. So a small novel, about 40, 45,000 words, but was ending heavy. Um, and so that's how I approach it. It was like, it's, it's, I, I feel, you know, I feel, I feel the whole thing as to what it's going to look like very much. You know, it's a visual thing for me as well. And it's an ending thing. I need to have the ending in place before I start. So even though they're different, for me, they feel very much leading on one after another. And the themes, very much the same. Sometimes they're sort of exaggerated and sometimes diminished depending which part of the photograph of these things that you're wishing to sort of um you know focus on hmm. uh a lot of our um members would um we have a lot of facebook pages a lot of the chapters have their own facebook page and a lot of our members were quoting quoting your lines and it's it's lovely to see that when that happens because you write yeah. so poetically and beautifully um, well, not, not all books are written like that. Mm. I like to, you know, I just, uh, you know, there's a lot of writers that I like. I don't write like in the sense that, as I say, I think a lot of this has to do with where I've come from. You know, I haven't come up through university. I haven't come up through that studying of literature. And so I don't really think I have any rules in that sense. I don't, there's not much to follow. I just need to follow what I've always followed, which is the power, the willing suspension of disbelief, number one, and, you know, telling a story in, with as much sort of emotional acuity and honesty as possible. 
and those two things totally come out from, from acting, from the theatre school. Um, I'm going to dive in. Ladies, if anybody has any questions, please, there is a raise um, your hand functionality. Functionality, I keep saying that. There is a raise your hand function, and uh, you can also ask in the chat window on the right hand side. So if you do have any questions, um, we're very, very happy to have you ask them live. So please go ahead. Uh, I'm going to dive into character and actual um, storyline here. Um, I was mm -hmm. wondering, Sarah, if you could talk to us about the women in Tin Men. Both of them are absolutely stunning characters, Annie and Dora. And I just wondered, um, are they based on anybody, or can you, or can you discuss them a little bit? Um, no, 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 no characters are really based on anyone I know in that sense. Um, so. The women are the most important characters in this book. And Annie actually is the most important character in this book, even though she doesn't have a story. That makes her the most important character um, because she remains enigmatic and she is the character who gives these two men the happiest times of their life. She is the hinge and she makes them family. And without Annie, then they probably wouldn't have moved into adulthood in the kind of friendship that they have. And Annie is somebody so modern before her time and so accepting and so judgmental. And there is, there is, there's always this hint with these women, what I call strong women, that, that I've noticed that I want to celebrate, really, that I'm not there to to write certain stories that other people write because I would have written them in my 20s. I want to write about women who, who have that healing capacity on damaged malehood because that ultimately is what these women do. It's a feminist book, strangely, even though it is led by two men. And it's a feminist book because what you have, you have this whole ideal of, of Dora, and Mabel recognizing in these young men that we have to hold them and we have to protect them from what society is going to do to them very shortly. And it's about honoring what was in front of them. You know, the whole thing of men and boys are capable of beautiful things and holding that for as long as possible. At which point Annie came along and wanted the same thing. You know, it's by Annie's, Annie understanding that it doesn't matter who loves who, but she knew the key to unlocking her husband was that he, he, he looked at this friendship, relationship, sexual relationship of his early years, because that's, that was so important for him. It's not, it wasn't something that had to be pushed away or felt shamed. You know, that's not where she came from. And so these women are extremely positive in a way that, that is sort of before their time. Um, and I just, it's my celebration of women. You know, they, women, women have, have the chance to bring good men into the world. And, um, and it needs healing from that point of view, I think. And so this is what my women do. And that started with, um, with Marvellous, who, for those who are interested further with that, with sort of psychology, she would be, in Jungian terms, the divine feminine, which is the creator, and the healer, the person who listens, who is receptive, has resonance, and most of all cherishes the body and cherishes matter, which means she cherishes the earth. And now I see that there are elements of that in all these female characters, because that to me is the most powerful element in this world today. And that's the thing that's going to, these are the people who are going to bring around healing. So, so that's where I'm stretching the muscle with these women. Um, that how lucky these men were to have them. Um, I find that that's so amazing, especially as you were saying, like you, the, the story is really told from, uh, from the perspective of Michael and Ellis, which are obviously male. Uh, can you discuss a little bit, just um, telling the story from, from 
the perspective of a male perspective. Um, yeah, interesting because I kind of I, I wanted to get it right, and I also wanted to get you know I've read a lot of gay male literature over the years, so you know Edmund White and you know some of Comte Bean's uh, stuff and Paul Manette and you know lots of various writers of that period I've suddenly totally forgotten with well, James Baldwin and all of that and I wanted to get it right that's all I knew I don't know what right means but I knew what it would feel like to me when I'd done it and so part of that was I could never I could never make somebody feel that this was a male writer I mean that's daft so what I aimed for was to try and make it feel as gender neutral as possible that somebody might who didn't know me they might pick it up and they for, for a brief moment they would forget that maybe I wrote it so sort of iron that out and so what was necessary was to to find my femaleness as a writer and then to let it go which was really weird so but I needed that certainly for the first part with Ellis um, because one of the things I can be very descriptive I like that I like place I like to play with that sort of metaphor but of course metaphor is 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 open to somebody who who understands meaning it brings meaning that's what it's there for and of course with a character like Ellis that's gone and so what was necessary was to make the writing in the first part literal, literally literal. That he gets up, he goes to work, he washes. And that was really, really bizarre to just write like that until, of course, we got into the past and then colour came back. So it's very much like colour came back, but it's black and white. And then colour came back. When he was dreaming, colour would come back, get back to the everyday, just like that. And what I was finding difficult was I couldn't work out where I was with him as a writer. I couldn't, I couldn't sort of, couldn't connect with him. And that changed when um, I wrote one of the, I call it chapters, although there's no chapters. But when I wrote one of the scenes and I wrote it in the first person. And that was when he was invited to the party next door. And so that scene was written totally in the first person. And I understood the, the man then, because suddenly what came out was he, he's attractive. He doesn't know he is. He's bruised. This delightful young woman fancies him like crazy. And he loves it, but she's too young. And I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, he's this type of man. You know, he can recognize beauty and he can recognize this oh, she's lovely, and how lucky when a young man will come into her life. But it's like, I think he says, you know, yes, she's this, she's this, and she's much too young. And that all these people were interested in him, and I suddenly got to know the man, and then I flipped it back to third person. But that was okay, because then I suddenly had an insight. I could feel him, and then I could write it. And then, of course, by the time I got to Michael, I knew it was first person anyway. That was always going to be the case mainly because of what Annie kept saying to Ellis, you've got to find him, go find him during their estrangement. And early on, I realized, well, how do you find someone? <laughs> how do you find someone who's dead? Um, basically, you bring something back whereby the person can hear their voice, which is writing of some sort, you know, letting somebody know their secrets, letting them know how they feel about you. So by the time I got to Michael, Michael was easier because I understood Michael and it was first person and, you know, that's part of my life. You know, it came out in the 80s. And so that was a much easier thing. And of course, Michael does have meaning. You know, he's angry, there's a lot going on in his life, but he's not shut down. And so it's a, it was a far more natural way of writing. Um, I could listen to you all day. It's so fascinating to hear to hear the insight. Um, I have a question here, and you were um, 
her, it's from Rebecca and she's from Detroit. Um, she says that your book is incredibly tender and beautiful and she wanted to know how difficult it was for you to talk and cover the idea of AIDS in the book. And it's interesting, you, like you just said it, I mean, it was, it was uh, it's of your generation. Yeah, it is. It was as simple as that. And why I wanted to write, if we go way back to 2011, 2012, I was doing some publicity. I was on an event for Rabbit. And this guy stood up and he said, I just need to know. He said, you've covered 40 years or certain things. He said, and you never wrote about AIDS. And I said, this is the wrong story to write about AIDS. But I will write about it. I promise you I will write my story or what I want to convey. So I always knew I would. But it was, it was sort of getting that period right. Um, I wanted to write about it because there's a lot of younger people, the younger generation, who just don't know about it. It's as simple as. And a lot of young LGBTQ uh, young people, not so young as well, who enjoy immense freedoms. Certainly, certainly in my country they do. I think yours are being uh, eroded a little bit, but you still have incredible freedom there as well. Um, in Europe, we do. Other countries, I think 72 other countries, they don't. But if we just focus on where we are, they enjoy incredible freedom because of that time. Political movements have to start somewhere. And certainly in America, your fight was very different to the fight here. David France talks about that very much in How to Survive a Plague, about the fight with the pharmaceuticals. And that it was a very, very politicized fight. AIDS became it with um, ACT UP. And so when you, something galvanized politically, it follows on and now you have marriage. It didn't just come out of the blue. It came from great sacrifice and you need to know your history, I believe, because it all comes around and bites you again, as we are all seeing. Um, and so it was very important to tell that story, uh, that time of confusion, but more than ever, to show, to tell a story of care. So, and that's what I wanted to do. Uh, a friend of my mother's opened the AIDS ward on St. Bart, in St. Bart's Hospital during that period of time, which I think was probably 87, 88. So I could talk with her about it, about actually what happened. Um, most of the AIDS wards, for those who don't know, um, it was palliative care because there was no treatment. There was AZT, but that was toxic for 50% of the people. So from 1980, say, if you talk about maybe the first diagnosis, to 96, when you had the drug combination therapy known as Lazarus, you had 16 years of horror for so many people. And also what came out there was, was this sort of bigotry that happens uh, very, very easily when right-wing governments are in power. The focusing on difference, the focusing on people who are not like you. Um, and the scapegoating. And so also what came out during that period of time is that you had people who were innocent victims and people who deserved to be victims. So if I talk predominantly of gay men and uh, IV drug users, you know, that was supposed to happen to you because you were low down on the rung of humanity. But then we have innocent victims. We had haemophilia. So there was all this posturing what I wanted to say the story of, no matter what people were focusing on, who does what in bed, who were their sexual practices, for me, it was one of the greatest stories of care that has become invisible. Where families disowned their children, often, and strangers would come in, often, and up friends, and look after them. Men looking after men in the most tender, most self-sacrificing way, knowing maybe that they were diagnosed as well and what they were tending to, what they were dealing with, maybe their journey a year, two years down the line. That's the story that needs to be told. And it needs to be told, it needs to be remembered because there are a lot of walking wounded still out there and it hasn't gone away. A million people die a year and there will be something else that comes around because these kind of plagues, diseases, whatever you want to call do, and it needs to be dealt with in a, in a very different kind of humanity than it was back then. Um, 
And so I wanted to write about that uh, because it needs to be known about. Simple as that. Wow, okay. <laughs> Um, can we visit the topic of your title? Um, you said something very interesting um, a few questions back, and that was about the fact that you knew how the, the story would end. When does the title come into play, and can you, can you discuss it a little bit? Um, the title came very, very early on uh, because it was the, it's, it's the job description. It's, it's a job in a car factory on the line. Less so now, I have to say. Well, I don't know if it exists now. Maybe one does. So for those who don't know about um, manufacturing, when we used to manufacture cars. So let's go back to the 60s and 70s, definitely. A little bit of the 80s. So in Oxford, they were manufacturing cars there. There was two factories, definitely in the 60s and 70s. One was called Press Steel. Literally, they pressed the steel. Um, the different parts of the cars, the, the doors, the, the wings, all of that. Then they shipped it over to Morris's, which became something else, to the car factory. You've got this long assembly line, and it's basically, you build a car. So by the end, it's on wheels, it's painted, and it's driven out. Now, at various points along the assembly line, you would have something called the tinny bay, which is where the tin man worked. And so when it was quite raw, he would be hammering if there was ever any dents, because obviously, when pressed panels come over, it's so, you know, in those days anyway, it was like bashed around and if there were dents or blemishes, they were hammering them out with these sort of weird handmade tools that have been passed down through the generations of tin men. And then as it became, the cars became more recognizable cars or more finished cars, when you got say to the paint shop, suddenly you would, there would be a tinny bay whereby cars which were painted and pristine if there was a scratch or a blemish they would go in and they could get these dents out without damaging the paint and i'm thinking they're going what and he was sort of i, I met a guy and he was showing me how to do it and i and i you know i found it because he was he was so inarticulate in describing how he did it that in the end i went to say because it's all in his hands I said, just show me how to do it. And then he would sort of draw things and then he, his hands would be doing this. And you don't actually bash it, you, you bash from behind. So it's sort of this weird thing that is springing and it's not denting. And I just was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is incredible. So, okay, this is, this is the job. This is what he's gonna do, he's a tin man. Um, however, I know the thing that I am always asked and I'm probably jumping the gun here. Um, people always go, was that the connection with the Wizard of Oz? Mm -hmm. Well, I would be daft to ignore a possible connection, but it had absolutely nothing to do with a man looking for his heart. Ellis has a heart, that's not it. So the association that I found interesting was um, the idea of the yellow brick road. And that to me is the idea of journeying towards truth, and towards the idea of self-actualization and integration. And so that idea I really liked. So we've got that. So we're looking at the yellow brick road. If we just push that over to a side there. When, um, I've been down to Arles in the south of France before. My partner's a photographer and there's a big photographic festival down there. Um, that runs throughout the summer, but the first week is, um, uh, they have a lot of people giving talks down there. Anyway, we've, we've been down there a few times. So I was very familiar that this is where Van Gogh walked and painted and lived. And when I was down there one year, probably about four or five years ago, I was reading a book down there, which was a collection of letters that Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo, called Dear Theo, a compilation that was brought together by a man called Irving Stone, who later went on to um, write and direct Lost for Life, which was an early 1955, I think it was, story of Van Gogh and Paul Gauguin. So I read this and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, because actually, you know what? If I cut in, I didn't particularly like the sunflowers as a painting. I felt it had become disempowered through that sort of 
for its populism, popularity rather. You know, that it was on everything and that sort of diminished what it was. So I wasn't a great fan per se. So I'm reading these letters. And the last bit is his desire to journey to the South. And he's going, I know this will make me a better painter. It'll make me a better person. I want to go towards the light. I want to go towards the sun. I want to go towards the yellow. And he wrote so incredible. I mean, he's a brilliant writer. So I came to his work through his writing because the way he writes about loneliness and about love and about art and about creativity and about his moods as much as he understands them is so fascinating. And he also would describe canvases before they were actually on the canvas. So the colors that he would use. And it was one of the, during one of those letters that I took the quote at the beginning of the book that he does actually say, it's done me good to go south, the better to see the north. So then we sort of, it's starting to formulate in my head, oh, we've got journeying. We've got somebody journeying from north to south. That's his part of the sun, instead of east to west, the Wizard of Oz. And then I was, you know, reading that he was waiting for Paul Gauguin to go and join him and set up a studio. And he wrote in his letters to his brother that he'd done a series of sunflowers as decorating for Paul Gauguin's room. And it was like, oh my God, what a gesture. It's mm -hmm. like somebody, for me, of going out into the field and picking flowers. That, that he loved him. He loved this idea of this man coming to spend time with him which was when Dora says, I believe that men and boys are capable of beautiful things because she would have read those letters when this book came. And suddenly I had my journey. And that's because the sunflowers and the yellow of the sunflowers and the yellow of the sun became the yellow brick road. And the motif of that was what the characters had to do. Two of them, obviously physically, both Alice and Michael and Dora metaphorically that every time she looked at that painting, she could travel. Um, so that was what the association, but it started with definitely Tin Man as, um, as a job. All right, wow. <laughs> um, I have, we are running out of time, but I have two, um, two short questions for you. Um, one of them is who inspires you as far as authors or, or books? And the other one is um, if you're working on anything else that we can look forward to. <laughs> Who inspires me? And lots of people inspire me. Um, Tim Winton, um, an Irish writer, Donald Ryan, Colm Tobin, John McGahan. I love Irish writers. Really, really love Irish writers. Uh, as I said, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Sarah Waters, Jeanette Winterson. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of unstable, you know, and Tyler. Uh, I just like, I like a good story, you know? It doesn't have to be complex or plotted in a different way. I just like stories about people. And when people can write that well, then I'm sort of drawn to that. Um, what am I, yeah, yeah, I'm sort of, you know, I'm starting. You can see I'm fidgeting. It's hard to talk about because I don't, you know, I'm such a chaotic writer that I sort of have an ending and I, I sort of have characters and then I jump in and everything that I thought, all the notes that I've made for the last two years as I've been on the road, uh, I don't think any of them is relevant because I've just sat down to do sort of the first 4,000 words and um, I've been blindsided. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it could be, it's, it's probably set in Florence um, and uh, in my favourite sort of period of time in the 70s and 80s, uh, probably with a group of maybe a family or a group of people who suddenly found themselves there. Uh, but I don't know really any more than that. Um, and probably if anybody looks at this in three years time, it won't be that. <laughs> but I'm just in that very awkward, fidgety, uh, anxious phase of creation. And uh, you would imagine it might be easier than it is, and it never is. 
So yeah, any writers out there who would just think they're failing miserably, join the club. It's funny that you say that because having listened to you for the last um, for the last little while, I mean, the amount of effort and the thought that goes into everything that you write is it's very clear and it's very everything is very um, um, what is the word baby brain succeed. <laughs> Not everything, but like everything you do, like I, sometimes you come across authors who everything is very um, like purposeful. That's the word I'm looking for. So everything you, it seems like everything you write has great purpose and, and you can explain it and, and there's a great thought behind it, which is, which is very beautiful. And then we hear like your oral storytelling background and it's very, very rare that we come across an author that, that has um, the ability on both sides because some people either they write or they act. It's not usual that, that they do both or that they're very, very, uh, they're very, very um, able to do both. So it's, it's really incredible to talk to you and hear, hear the background and hear the story. Hear about the story. Thank you. It's probably, well, you know, I didn't work. Most actors out there are working maybe, so they don't. I didn't work. You know, people always say that. They said, you know, how did you find time? I, like, I had plenty of time. <laughs> I had plenty of time to do something. So it seemed natural to just write a story. Well, you're clearly a very, um, a very accomplished, um, creative, whether it's on stage or <laughs> on the page. Um, and we really, really appreciate your time and, uh, and talking to us tonight. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been lovely, really. And yeah, eye-opening, this. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to our next book. Good luck with everything. Good luck with the next book, two weeks. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for joining us, and we'll... Yes, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. See you. <laughs>